I appreciate everybody showing up. What we're going to do first is we're going to kind of a little bit unorthodox the way we usually do things. We had the National Weather Service show up here uh, earlier today and, and been doing some estimates on some uh, wind damage and, some, and making some estimations on what happened. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to let them introduce, introduce themselves and I'm going to let them talk first, all right, so they can give you all the information on the weather. And then as soon as they get done, then we'll come up and go ahead with our regular briefing, okay? All righty. This is, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves from the National Weather Service, all righty? Look this way, too. My name is Joe Sullivan. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the National Weather Service Office in, in Louisville. Speak up. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Joe Sullivan, the National Weather Service uh, Warning Coordination Meteorologist out of Louisville. And I'm Ron Prince Bolinski, uh, uh, National Weather Service out of St. Louis, on the Quick Response Team, and I'm a Science and Operations Officer in St. Louis. Can you just spell your last name for me? Yeah, it's P R Z Y B Y L I N. SKI. Thank you. <laughs> Do I need to spell Sullivan for anyone? <laughs> okay. Uh, what we have here today, obviously, is a, is a devastating tornado. Uh, we actually have three different teams that are out doing damage assessments along this tornado because of the uh, because of the very long path with it, and uh, what uh, the path uh, length. We don't. We haven't determined yet uh, if it's all continuous or if it was skipping. But uh, we'll be doing uh, looking at some of the flyover uh, video along with uh, our damage assessments on the ground. But uh, at, it's at least 52 miles in length from where we believe it started to uh, where it crossed the river and went over into Kentucky. Uh, in all three locations that our teams have been out, we've determined it's at least a low-end EF4, which places it in the top 2% of all tornadoes, uh, that uh, tornado intensity of all uh, tornadoes that have ever occurred. So it's in that uh, violent category that uh, most tornadoes never come anywhere near to. Uh, I have not actually been out on any of the damage survey teams, but I have been here in Henryville and have seen some of the most uh, intense and incredible damage I've ever seen in all of my damage surveys, and I've done a number of them, especially here in the Ohio Valley. Uh, if you've been over to the school, you know what I'm talking about with the uh, school buses that have had the chassis ripped off, uh, school, uh, uh, the uh, cars that are lined up, uh, the missiles that uh, flew into the school, and, and uh, obviously uh, it was a tragedy in that there was a loss of life in Henryville, but having been to the school, I cannot, uh, I can't emphasize how fortunate it was that the school had let everyone out beforehand because if we'd had a couple hundred kids in there, we would not be standing here saying that there was, uh, was just one fatality. There would have been many, many fatalities in that school. So I think uh, this is a, uh, well, there has been loss of life in both Kentucky and in Indiana. I think it's a great success of the entire warning program, how it works with the uh, National Weather Service, with all the media, social media, everything. Everybody knew that this was coming and, uh, and they let school out early so that the kids wouldn't be there. And so I, I just want to get that down right now, that this could have been an incredible tragedy with scores of fatalities. So it's been a very good day in that respect. Uh, the, the buildings can be rebuilt. Uh, and I'll uh, let uh, Ron uh, discuss uh, just what caused all the destruction here, what he saw, and what the wind estimates are. Yes, um, we focus our attention roughly about six, seven miles west of Henryville through the north side of Henryville here and we came across a concentrated tornadic damage being about 150 yards wide. It does vary in width at times. It does drop down to about uh, roughly 100 yards wide uh, east of I-65 here and then begins to widen up here uh, further on to the north side of Henryville and further on to the northeast. Uh, we do see a, what's called a satellite tornado track south of the major concentrated damage with the main tornado. And this is pretty common we see uh, with these violent episodes of uh, tornado activity, we see a satellite tornado to the south. I've seen this in the Evansville, Indiana tornado back in 2005. I've seen this in other cases, uh, like I say, back in 1990 and so forth. And uh, like I say, th this, uh, this, is, this ranks one of the tops, like I say, in my career as being one of the most devastating tornadoes um, in the past 30 years I've been doing damage assessment work. What, 
thing that I, I think ought to be pointed out is that there were actually two supercells that passed virtually in, over the same, some of the same territory from New Peak and up toward uh, Henryville uh, before they sort of split and took separate paths. And both of those tornadoes actually made it across the river into Kentucky in, in Trimble County and struck, uh, took out a fire station uh, five miles south of Milton and did some other damage in Kentucky. So uh, it was a very complicated situation and there's, it'll probably be some time before we can figure out exactly which tornado did which damage, uh, especially in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Henryville area toward New Pekin because they were both basically on the same path at that location. You know, let, let me add another comment. The first supercell, there was two supercells with this event that was crossing uh, across southern Indiana. Uh, the first supercell spawned a tornado that caused EF4 damage. We're estimating wind speeds around 175 miles an hour with the first uh, tornado that crossed uh, the northern portion of Henryville here. And we haven't had a chance to look at the second one yet, but uh, our plans are to continue to do the surveying tomorrow and possibly into Monday. But again, it's EF4 damage, the lower end of EF4 about 175 miles, uh, the wind speed with the actual tornado. Uh, one resident here said that he thought he saw it on his iPhone actually touched down about four miles from town here is where it started. Do you have a starting point that you believe where it first hit the ground? No, I think uh, there's other teams for the west of here that they're also looking at. I think it's, it starts much further to the southwest. Oh, it bounced. It bounced and it started further to the southwest quite a bit. And this is pretty characteristic that we see these things form much further to the southwest than one really expects. A lot of times when I do my assessments, I ask the person, well, I began right here and then I started traveling to the southwest about another 10 to 15 miles or 20 miles and it begins 15, 20 miles to the southwest. And again, these are long track supercells. So they are very violent storms. They have a long history of lasting for several hours, the long track supercells, and they can cause, again, devastating damage and produce winds, like I said, in this situation, 175 miles an hour. According to the radar data, the first storm uh, did uh, most of the damage. Is that your old assessment as well? The second one only a week or two later? Yeah, yeah. Right now, the first one it did the EF4 damage, uh, one EF4 damage, and on the radar, you might hear this term called debris ball. Does that ring a bell to anyone? So that debris ball is where you see the actual uh, uh, buildings, uh, structures, trees being lifted up by the actual vortex itself, the tornado itself, and usually that go, that gets uh, can, that can rise to as high as about 5,000 feet. And we can observe this on the, Dop on the actual Doppler radar. You see there are very nice country of high reflectivity on Doppler radar. And that's part of the debris bar on the southwest part of the storm. So. And we've already received reports from uh, about 68 miles uh, northeast of, uh, of Henryville. There's uh, some uh, documentation from uh, the banks here uh, that fell out of the sky. So we've got debris in, in Hebron or New Hebron uh, in Kentucky and across the river in Ohio, uh, 68 to 70 miles away of debris that was picked up here being deposited there. We talked we talk about how this is the top 2% in terms of violent tornadoes. Is there anything else that could put this in context, like how often this strength of tornado happens in say, you know, 50 years or a dozen years, or 100 years? <laughs> <laughs> I've been in service for 30 years. I can recall the June 2nd, 1990 event across Southern Indiana, uh, Bethlehem, Indiana, uh, and also Jasper, Indiana. Did that ring a bell to a few folks? And then we had an event. You've had some events recently, too, I think. Uh, well, recently, the uh, November 2005 event in, uh, across Evansville, Indiana, uh, that was high in EF3 damage. And uh, like I say, we've had one in St. Louis last year out by the airport. Uh, you might have heard about that so uh, tornado. Uh, no, I, I just, uh, usually this time of the year, uh, the atmosphere has strong dynamics. We got a very strong jet stream. We have a lot of moisture from the south being pulled uh, no, from the southern portion of the United States, and the mixed ingredients of the intense of the strong jet stream, the strong uh, dynamics with the system, combined with the uh, instability of the you know, coming from the south and southwest, and we have the ingredients for, I'd say, a major outbreak of severe weather. Any reason to worry that there's more coming? I mean, sure well, it's early spring. It's only March, uh, what, 3rd, 4th right now. I wouldn't be surprised we might see additional outbreaks. Uh, may not be this magnitude or this area coverage-wise across the you know, United States, but you might, we may find localized outbreaks uh, through the month of May. That's a given possibility.
at least one of the buses had to turn around and come back to the school. Was there any way to actually make sure that people were warned earlier than they were warned? Uh, well, uh, we do know that uh, uh, we have one fireman who said he heard the sirens go off and drove across Floyd County to uh, another fire station, came back here before uh, before the tornado actually hit in Henryville. So do you know how long between when they went off and when it hit? Uh, honestly, I don't have the information a a available right now, but I, I do know that uh, that we held a conference call a couple of hours before everything went on uh, at 11, uh, 11.30 a.m., and uh, there was a decision made by a number of school districts after that conference call to go ahead and let their kids out sometime between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. And I believe the tornado hit here at about 2.15, and they had released before 2 o'clock. When you mentioned about the EF4, is that just through the Henry County area or the uh, Henryville area? Or is that over like toward Chelsea? Uh, no, we do have uh, the, 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 all three teams did report EF4 damage, including over near the Chelsea area where. Uh, uh, it, it actually reduced a little bit to high-end EF3 before it hit across the river, and then over toward New Peak and EF4 damage as well. Any word on how the one was over in the Trumbull County area of Kentucky? That one, uh, the, there were two tornadoes there, and one was EF3. I believe the other one was rated uh, an EF2. When you had your 1130 conference call, did you make any recommendations on how soon people should evacuate? Well, we never tell anyone to evacuate per se, but we tell them what time we expect the storms to come through. And we did give them a, a time frame that would be around two o'clock. So, uh, you know, we can't make the decision for school administrators to, to release or, but we think it's a, it was a very wise decision in this case.